In part 6.1, we took a look at how the component of noise fits into financial time series, alongside the components of deterministic and stochastic price action. So following on now from last week where we looked at ways of reducing events overfitting, we now move on to technique number five and look specifically at how to reduce noise overfitting. The most effective way of doing this is by reducing the degrees of freedom that the optimization model uses. The degrees of freedom are the number of independent variables that a statistical model uses to predict the dependent variables. So in our context, this represents the number of parameters we're optimizing in order to help predict what might happen to price action and therefore determine when trade orders are executed. It's effectively the number of parameters that are free to vary as you build your model during the optimization. Now, the key point here is that the more degrees of freedom you have, the more your model is capable of adapting to increasingly granular patterns in the price data. And the most granular patterns in our data are, of course, the noise. So thinking that the optimization of a large number of parameters is in some way increasing the sophistication of your process or making it more effective is just plain wrong. All you are doing, taking this approach, is training your system to understand the stochastic movements of noise. But these are patterns that will never predictably repeat again. As I said before, I, I speak to traders every single day, and when I review their optimization designs, I can see that they're attempting to optimize seven or eight parameters simultaneously. The most I've ever come across was 18, and some of these were producing as little as a few hundred trades. Well, I'm sorry to say that unfortunately those systems will never take money out of the markets for as long as they're being optimized in that way. When I perform my optimizations, the maximum number of parameters that I will ever optimize is three. Although I try to keep it to two if at all possible. And doing this with sample sizes in the many thousands makes for a reliable and robust process. Now it is true that the higher your sample size, the more parameters you'll be able to safely optimize for an equivalent level of robustness. But to do this, the sample size needs to rise in an exponential way for each new parameter that you add. So for me, the maximum of three parameters is still a very hard limit. So let's now go into the illustration. Here, I'll perform one optimization using three degrees of freedom and one using five parameters. This seemingly small increase is enough to tip the balance and to over-optimize the system. And remember, this is a system that I know has a real edge, and it's proven to be a very profitable system for me in one of my live accounts. But you'll see how increasing the optimization to use five parameters instead of three completely destroys the system's ability to make money. So the two tests were undertaken using identical settings and conditions, apart from the number of parameters. So the same duration, trading the same instruments, and with identical in-sample versus out-of-sample walk-forward periods. So these are the settings that were common across both of the optimizations. So the optimization period to the walk-forward period was three to one. The number of instruments that were traded as part of the optimization was 22. They were all currency pairs. Um, this was undertaken on the 15 minute time frame. And in terms of the, the rules for the system, the entry criteria were based on a filter, which either allows trades to be executed or doesn't, plus a signal for the, for the timing of those trades and the exit criteria is based on the signal or a stop loss if that gets hit before the, the exit signal. So as I said before, in terms of the first optimization, we're looking at three parameters here, and that's one parameter on the filter itself, which is the, the level. So the filter is an oscillator, and that's the level at which trades will be allowed if it's greater than that level and will be disallowed if the the value is below that level. There's a, an execution level for the open signal and likewise for the closed signal. Now, importantly, I'm not using the number of periods for any of those indicators. 
as part of the optimization model. I've simply chosen sensible values for those and they don't get optimized, only the level gets optimized. But then in the second optimization, which looks at five, we've got the first three which are identical, but there are two more that are added in. One is the number of periods on the filter and the other is the number of periods on the open signal. Now you'll notice I haven't changed the close signal and the reason for that is because the close signal is, is enforced to use the same number of periods as the open signal so that we don't get any execution aliasing with trades closing as soon as they, they've been opened. Now I do think it's worth stating that the way I've optimized in this second optimization with two parameters being optimized for a single indicator, so that being the case for the filter and the open signal, is something I would never normally do. You'll actually see the reason for that when we look at the results from this optimization in a moment. And I'll highlight at that point why this is really a very bad idea. Here I've exported the results from the backtesting platform in order to analyze the data a little closer. First of all, if we take a look at the parameters that were optimized as part of this, you'll remember that we've got one from the filter, one from the open signal, and one from the closed signal. And for each of those, I have uh, three different values that I'm optimizing for the filter, four values for the open signal and three for the closed signal. Um, generally speaking, I like to keep my optimizations really, really simple. Um, so this equates to 36 different parameter combinations. To be more granular than this, really for me doesn't make any sense because we've already seen from previous episodes that because of random chance it's very unlikely you, you're going to be able to choose the the absolute optimum uh, parameter set with the best edge anyway and so there's little point in optimizing in that way with with lots and lots of uh, values here so going from 0 0.03 to 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 0 0.06 that just, just doesn't make any sense to me. It also means, of course, that your optimizations run a lot quicker. So we have 36 different parameter combinations and we've got the results of those underneath here. So the green section are the metrics for the optimization itself. And then the blue results are from the walk forward phase. So you can see here that the best pass in this particular case was pass 14 which achieved a optimization result of just over 25 using my chosen performance metric. And in the walk forward results that produced a score of 17.02. You can also see the number of trades here. So um, a little over a thousand in the optimization and about 350 in the, in the walk forward phase. And then over on the right hand side in the orange, we can see the actual parameter values that achieved those scores. So if we now take a look at the chart on the right hand side, this represents each of the passes plotted with the X value being the in-sample optimization score. So this green column here. And on the Y axis, we've got the out of sample optimization score. So the, the, the blue uh, column over on the right here. So taking a closer look at this, the first thing that strikes us is that generally it looks as if there's a fairly good relationship there. So as the in-sample scores increase along the x-axis, we can see the trend where the values for the, for the out-of-sample score are also increasing and the red linear regression line just confirms that that is the case. So if we take a look at some of the points, this one over here is the one that ultimately we would have probably chosen since it gave us the best in-sample score from the test. 
And we can see, looking across, this is actually the third best in terms of the walk forward performance. So that's fairly good. It's in the top 10%, which is what we said, if you remember, we're sort of aiming for from our optimization. If I'd done this over a larger period of time and got bigger sample sizes, who knows, this might have been even better still. Interestingly, the second choice would have been this one here, which is the fourth best in the walk forward phase. So again, that gives us some added confidence that we've we've done a good process um, as, as far as things go in, in the optimization using three parameters. Now you'll notice I've also calculated the R square value over here for the linear regression. And this is a statistical measure of how close the data points are to the regression line. It's also known as the coefficient of determination. And so you can look at this as a measure of how well the dependent variables on the y-axis are determined by the value of the independent variables along the, the x-axis. So basically, it's how well the in-sample score is indicative of the walk forward scores that we achieved. Now, a value of one is the maximum that can be achieved with R squared. And that would mean that every point was exactly on the linear regression line. So it would be a perfect model. So just remember this score, um, which is approximately 0 0.14, because we'll compare this to the R squared score in the second optimization when we optimize the five parameters. Next, we're going to look at the same system with all of the settings being identical, except for the fact that we'll be optimizing an additional two parameters, so five in total. So click on the link here to go to part 6.3.